Good evening, everyone. I'm Namu. I'm the membership manager at CUH. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Without any further ado, I'll now hand over to Neil Stetchbury, our patient and lead governor. Thank you. Neil, over to you. Sorry, Neil, you're on mute. Sorry, everyone, I was on mute then. Um, hello and good evening to everyone. Um, this is Neil Stutchbury. I'm the lead governor at uh, CUH. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce this uh, Medicines for Men Members lecture this evening. Um, we have a, 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 an interesting presentation on prostate cancer and some of the modern ways of uh, approaching it, um, given to us by uh, Professor Vincent Nyang Pagnasam. And he's going to talk about uh, some of the common myths of prostate cancer symptoms, uh, the complexity of some of the decision making uh, once it's diagnosed, and its growing economic and resource burden. Uh, Vincent's research has uh, covered the full section spectrum of basic science, translational, clinical, and epidemiological disciplines in prostatic cancer. Uh, he's uh, is director of the Cambridge Urology Translational Research and Clinical Trials Office on the campus and holds patents and won numerous prizes, including the University of Cambridge VC Award for Research Impact. So I'm going to hand over to Vincent now and um, to, to start his talk. Um, afterwards, we'll have some time for questions, um, uh, which you can place in the chat as we go along, and we'll pick those up at the end. OK, over to you, Vincent. Thank you very much, Neil, uh, and thank you, Namu. Um, I'll just uh, screen share. So I hope you can see uh, my slide uh, here, uh, the first slide. Uh, this talk is entitled Prostate Cancer, Cancer Epidemic of the Modern Age, uh, and I hope to uh, uh, take you through some of the controversies and issues that prostate cancer raises, because in my view, it's a very unusual cancer in that regard. I'm uh, Professor Vincent J. Nanapragasan, Professor of Urology at the University of Cambridge, an honorary consultant urologist, and my work in, in both research and clinical uh, terms is almost exclusively in this area. Um, my wife says I spend too much time thinking about the prostate gland, which is slightly worrying. If you'll indulge me, um, let me just tell you what the prostate gland is. So, so, so this is a gland which sits at the bottom of the bladder. Its primary function is to provide uh, uh, nourishing fluids for semen to, to keep it uh, alive during fertility. Uh, but as it grows, it causes urinary symptoms and problems, which is what we commonly see in urology. And of course, within that, prostate cancers can arise, which is the subject of, of its thought, of this talk today. It's a fairly small gland, often described as walnut size, but it can actually grow to quite enormous sizes. And I don't mean prostate cancer here. I mean from a uh, prostate benign point of view. Prostate cancer itself, many of you will know, is a very common disease. It's estimated that one in eight men will develop prostate cancer. And here in the east of England, we have one of the highest rates of prostate cancer nationally, uh, about 5,000 cases per 100,000. The data you see on the right hand side at the top is the NPCA report from 2016. Uh, and there at that time, it was reported that about 42,000 cases were diagnosed per annum. This is actually now closer to 50,000, as you will see in a little while. CIUK have been tracking the incidence rate of cancers, and you can see that it's actually a quarter of all cancers in 2007 in a male. And in 2030, it's actually going to increase to 26%. And I suspect that that might be an underestimate. If we look at the burden of prostate cancer amongst cancers in England, you can see from this chart from NHS England, it is actually the most common cancer, far outweighing uh, nearly all the other urological cancers in terms of registrations. So a huge burden to the NHS, and one which I will show you in a little while, is going to grow. And the problem is not unique to the UK, because actually across Europe, prostate cancer also represents one of the top three cancers in terms of disease burden. So really um, very prevalent and very common, but it's not gonna stop there. 
This data, which was published a few years ago, tracked what might happen with prostate cancer incidence over the next 40 years. And you can see that the four cancers which are projected to grow are uh, colorectal, breast, lung, and of course, prostate cancer. And the worldwide incidence is going to go from 1.3 to 2.9 million. So we are really are facing, if you like, a pandemic of the disease. And that is why I feel it's something that we do need to prepare for. And of course, numbers is one thing. What comes with it is cost. And the cost for managing prostate cancer is escalating. This is some data from the US, which looked between 2016 and projected to 2027 on your right-hand side. And this is just a diagnostic market, meaning to say the cost of diagnosing the, of the disease. And you can see it's projected to increase by nearly threefold uh, within the next 10 years. But before we feel that this is only a UK problem like Brexit, actually it's not, it's a worldwide problem. And this data here shows you how the incidence of prostate cancer, the blue lines, is actually increasing in nearly every country across the globe. But on the converse side, the red line actually represents the number of deaths from prostate cancer. And that's what I now want to switch the focus on here, because although there's a lot of it about, it actually is not resulting in more and more men dying of the disease. So this is something we need to unpick. You will all know that prostate cancer pops up in the news every so often. It's a favorite amongst the news hacks like breast cancer. And in 2018, we had these headlines here. Prostate cancer now kills more uh, people in the UK than breast cancer. It's the silent killer that must be stopped. So really, these kind of headlines uh, do result in a lot of men getting alarmed, coming forward for testing. In a way, it's a good thing. But it isn't as though these headlines say static. Because two years earlier, we had these headlines. Why not treating prostate cancer is best for men, and thousands are undergoing unnecessary treatment. Survival rates high, regardless of treatment. And of course, this has resulted in huge debate uh, in the press, in the media, and amongst, of course, specialists as well. And those of you who are still paying attention will notice the little text at the bottom there, which just goes to show you perhaps shouldn't always believe what you read. Now, let's, let's, let's unpick this a bit. The history of prostate cancer is actually quite a recent one. These are all famous characters who've got the disease, uh, but it was actually only first described in 1817. The first description was in that time. And John Adams did the first histological uh, delineation of the disease only in 1853. So in actual terms, only about 150 years ago. By 1993, there were only 50 cases reported worldwide, which really made it a fairly rare disease at the time, uh, and not one that people were particularly alarmed about. But as I've told you already, by the current era, it is the most common cancer amongst men, with nearly 50,000 in the UK alone, and this is going to increase to almost 70,000 uh, within, uh, within five years. So what has happened here to take this disease? Has something changed in the water? Has the air, uh, has the air somehow made us all develop cancerous prostates, or at least the men anyway? Well, actually, it's much more simple than that. And this data from Cancer Research UK, which is freely available, actually tells the story with, as to why prostate cancer has become so prominent. If you look at the top panel, this talks about the incident statistics. So this, again, is laboring a point, 50,000 a year, 14% of all cancers. But look at the peak age of incidence, 75 to 79 years. And the trend over time is an increase of 50% since the 1990s for the incidence of cancer. But this second panel talk, tells a slightly different story. Certainly a high number of deaths, about 12,000, about 7% of all deaths. But look at this box here. This is the peak rate of prostate cancer deaths, 90. So in other words, you've got to live long enough to develop it by and large, and you've got to live long enough to die of it. So really, this is the clue as to why this has become such a massive problem. It is because men are living longer through interventions that are actually getting rid of other competing mortality. So very much the case that the lifetime risk of prostate cancer is three times higher than the risk of death. And they're all saying that you live with it rather than die from it, actually is largely true. And these data here shows you exactly what is happening and what is going to happen. Again, from Cancer Research UK, you can see that this is the age of diagnosis, the, the distribution of the most likely age of diagnosis around 70 to 74, and the most likely age of death between around 90 years or so. 
This is a very interesting graph and tracks the life expectancy of males and females from 1840 right up till 2020. And you can see immediately that before the 1950s and 60s, men didn't live long enough to actually present commonly with the, with the disease. So we didn't really see it. It wasn't really a big deal. But when you get to this point, you started to get more and more men diagnosed with prostate cancer and a PSA test came around here. And so we got more and more men developing uh, a diagnosis. And here is where men started to live into that age group where they were starting to die of prostate cancer. So this is a generational issue. Because we've taken out competing risks, because we've increased longevity, we have allowed this cancer now to become much more prominent. So really, it has been a double-edged sword. The problem is that this is going to get even more compounded. Boys born in the UK, according to ONS statistics, are expected to live an average of 87 years. So really, you're going to have to multiply the number of urologists managing prostate cancer by many fold to deal with all these men who are going to develop the disease in due course. Because they're not dying of anything else, all very fit and well, running around, exercise, gym, marathons, you name it. So the question is, of course, should a man get checked or not checked? Because as you will know, that is a big debate which happens uh, which, has, which is happening in the UK. Before I get into what actually happens in a diagnosis, I want to sort of uh, talk about a pet issue of mine, and that is the link between urinary symptoms and prostate cancer. Actually, there is no link. This is a very commonly held myth, which is very ingrained in the male psyche, and in fact, in the media psyche. The idea that because you've got trouble peeing and, and, and difficulty passing water, get up at night, you may have prostate cancer. Conversely, though, men who don't have these symptoms think they can't have prostate cancer. And this is a piece of work, Cambridge work, which came out last year, which actually looked into this. And it turns out there's an inverse relationship between prostate size and urinary symptoms and the likelihood of prostate cancer. And this data has actually been around for the last 30 years, but hasn't really come to the fore. And in fact, if you wait for urinary symptoms, you may actually present late with the, with the disease. And so many times in clinic, I see men with advanced prostate cancers. And the first thing they say to me is, well, I had no warning. I had no problems passing water. I was the envy of my friends. So that myth, I think, is really important to debunk. This paper over 20 years ago actually explored this in a population. And they asked what people thought in the general public was their view were symptoms of prostate cancer. And Urinary symptoms was associated with disease in 86% of the case, and only 1% of the population were aware that it could be asymptomatic, which is really very striking. But other things like passing blood, impotence, back pain, and, and even stomach cramps was thought to be associated, and even hair loss, which makes me quite worried because obviously I'm in that group myself. So getting the message out that just because you have you no know, symptoms, you should still get checked, I think is one of the key things we need to do. And in fact, we have launched from Cambridge through this work, our own awareness campaign that prostate cancer is silent. Uh, and actually a man should go and get checked whether or not you have urinary symptoms. So let's take you through what happens. So the first step in the diagnosis is the PSA blood test, which I'm sure many of you heard is called prostate specific antigen. It's produced by the prostate and is raised in many cases of prostate cancer, but not always. You might get a prostate examination by your GP, and if you're lucky, it's somebody with slim fingers. If it's not, then well, too bad. You then get referred up to the hospital, and more likely than not these days, you will get an MRI scan to see if there's anything in there which looks suspicious. And after that, a prostate biopsy. Now, I wouldn't be, uh, I, I wouldn't be trumpeting Cambridge achievements if I didn't also put a plug in for a device we ourselves have invented in Cambridge to try and make biopsies safer called the CAM probe, which some of you may have heard. But the first step is whether to get checked. And in this regard, we know that men are shy, retiring types. They don't like to trouble anybody or make a fuss. So we need to encourage them to go forward and get checked. And Prostate Cancer UK have helpfully developed a website which you can access called Check Your Risk. And actually it goes through what the tests are, what might happen, what it means. And I would encourage men uh, of a certain age to actually go and have a look at this. But like I said before, PSA testing and finding prostate cancer is very controversial. And you will see in the headlines many things about 
uh, you don't want that. You don't want to get that PSA test. Others saying you should get the PSA test. Uh, and uh, this particular GP uh, who, who, who writes for the Times saying that he's never had the test and he never had one done. But Prostate Cancer UK is encouraging us to. And the real conundrum is that, like I said to you, it's very common, but the small number of men who might die of prostate cancer is quite hard to detect amongst the large number of men who may be detected with clinically insignificant cancers or cancers that are unlikely to affect them. So this is a conundrum currently as to whether or not we should introduce routine PSA testing. And of course, that brings me to the issue of screening. The UK has actually led in a number of key trials trying to unpick this. And this is one big trial called the CAP trial, where they looked at a single PSA test and compared the outcome of survival or not against men who did and did not have the test. And at 14 years, there really was no difference in the risk of dying of the disease or, uh, or indeed overall mortality, actually. And so at the moment, the UK National Screening Committee does not recommend routine PSA testing as a screening uh, test for prostate cancer. But this PSA test has been both a boon and a curse. This data here on the left is actually quite an old paper from Australia. And it shows you what happens when you have PSA testing because it increases the incidence of cancer, but has a very marginal effect on mortality. So we thought we were doing very well by, by, by doing testing and finding all these cancers, but we haven't really changed mortality. And the reason for that is that PSA tests is not perfect. It's a very good marker and one of the best uh, blood-based biomarkers out there, but it can suggest cancer where there is none, it can miss cancers, and it can also find cancers. So at the moment, PSA test uh, is the first gold standard test, but it's not perfect. The other conundrum is what level should be used to refer men in? And this is actually quite a big problem because the range of which a PSA should be normal can be affected by age and the size of a prostate. So the idea of the PSA age references came about some years ago and is actually in use in every hospital, uh, in every alliance across the country. The problem is that actually no one can quite agree what those ranges should be. This is another piece of Cambridge research from a couple of years ago where we actually delved into this and found that there were 10 different PSA thresholds being used across the different cancer alliances in the UK. And depending on where you lived and what your own hospital ranges were, you could actually be referred or not referred if you didn't meet those thresholds. And there was about a 3 to 12 percent variation in the chance of missing a cancer, let alone within the alliance, actually within the region and within hospitals, there are actually different PSA ranges. NICE, unfortunately, has not been able to actually give us clarity on this. So it currently is the case that there is variation in even what PSA level should trigger a referral in. So moving on from the PSA, how do we improve that? Well, there's been a lot of work in this area, and I mentioned to you about MRI already, and the principal aim of MRI is to try to screen out men with high PSAs where actually there isn't anything that's worth investigating or biopsying. And it has some good effectiveness in that regard. But there are also many other additional serological tests which can actually achieve this, uh, called the PHI, 4K, the PCA3, lots of them out there, which have been shown to be better than PSA. The problem, though, is that how do you fit that into the pathway and also how do you afford that hasn't really been worked out or looked into. But currently, uh, MRI has been rolled out to every unit across the country at, at quite a lot of cost and ex expense, and this is a useful test. Of course, people are asked now asking, well, if we've got this great MRI, how about doing screening with that? And this is a huge area of contention and debate because obviously we want to reduce the number of men having investigations, but there is issues about the whole point of screening, which is to reduce the risk of dying of the disease. And so far, we don't really have that evidence yet. PC UK are particularly keen to try to develop screening with MRI scans, so rather than blood test to biopsy, which is what it was, uh, blood test to scans and biopsy. Uh, and it's a reasonable idea. The problem, of course, is how do we fund uh, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of scanners we're going to use to screen all men? Uh, and interestingly, in the current climate, uh, actually, is it sustainable? Because MRI is a very energy uh, consuming uh, resource. In Cambridge, again, we've been exploring some work in this area, and we have uh, published evidence that introducing a serological marker can both reduce the use of MRI biopsies and also cost less. But how to get this into practice and implementation to refine pathways and to actually make this a reality is something which, interestingly enough, 
there are not many people who like to fund this because it's not exciting. Uh, and actually, pathways and implementation is a very different world from primary research discovery. So once you get past that gauntlet of PSA and MRI, you'll go forward for a prostate biopsy. In the past, the biopsies were done in, th in what's known as a random or systematic way from different areas of the prostate. But now, because of the MRI and availability, we can do targeted sampling. So taking it from specific areas as well as the rest of the biopsy. And Cambridge has led on setting up some very innovative fusion technology, uh, which we have pioneered and we teach others to do as well. Those biopsy samples then go on to a pathologist and they look it under the microscope and they work out whether there is cancer, number one, and number two, how aggressive is it? They use something called the grade group system, which goes from a one to a five, um, uh, uh, which, is, which, is a, uh, which is quite confusing because it used to be called the Gleason score system, which went from a six to a 10. Suffice to say, if you have a grade group one, that's the least aggressive type, and a grade group five is the most aggressive. So we take that PSA diagnosis, we take the biopsy information, and the next thing we do is we look at the stage, which is to say to what extent has the cancer within the prostate or actually gone through the prostate. And that T staging is often done using MRI these days and previously by clinical examination. If a man then is diagnosed with prostate cancer, when I started uh, in this field, you are basically told him the diagnosis and then you offered him a menu of different treatments he could choose from. And it was very much the case that we would say, well, you could have surveillance or monitoring, you could have surgery, you could have radiotherapy or radioactive seeds or maybe some new treatments. Uh, tell us what you'd like to do and we'll refer you on. Certainly for some men, that was the case. Other men had fewer choices. But it wasn't a very informed way of doing it. And the way we were doing it was clearly not correct because of data which came about about, if, about the actual benefits of treatment. This is the PROTECT study, one of the largest, in fact, the largest and only randomized study of uh, surveillance versus treatment in prostate cancer. Cambridge was a participant of this study. Now, if you know these graphs and you look on the left, you will see that the top left one talks about the risk of dying of prostate cancer, and the three options are to have surgery, radiotherapy, or monitoring. And immediately, you don't have to be a statistician to see there was actually no difference in the survival of patients up to 17 years after follow-up, regardless of which arm they read into. And if you look at metastases, which is cancer which has spread, there was a slight, uh, there was a higher level in those men who had surveillance, but really over 90%, regardless of which treatment group you were, was still metastasis-free at 10, at 17 years. So really, there was no difference uh, between, between these arms and this is really important because therefore we need to understand how best to counsel our patients. And that comes down to risk benefit. Again, when I started in, uh, in prostate cancer, we were using a system known as the Demico, on, or which became the nice three tier system, which put men into three baskets, low risk, intermediate and high risk. And effectively, we made decisions or recommended decisions based on these three tiers. But these three tiers were actually developed not to work out the risk of dying of prostate cancer, but actually the risk of disease relapse or progression. So this wasn't really built for counseling somebody about what to do about their prostate cancer and whether they needed anything doing at all. In 2016, we decided to look at this and we looked at the East of England population of about 10,000 men. And we saw that when you applied these risk groups to those men, uh, actually, it wasn't very good at predicting cancer mortality. In fact, the concordance or the accuracy was only about 69%. So we decided to look at these factors that went into these models and see if we could improve it. And that resulted in the Cambridge prognostic groups, which allowed us to identify five different tiers of men who, who had very different outcomes, depending on the factors that went into it. And that improved the prediction of uh, accuracy by over 80%. To cut a very long story short, I'm pleased to say that the National Institute for Clinical Excellence have now adopted the CPG classification as the national standard, replacing the street tier system, and that is now in use in Cambridge and across the UK. Uh, so surprisingly, not Scotland. Apparently up there, they can do whatever they like, which is an interesting fact I found out recently. Now, the reason why this is important is this graph here on the, on the right side. These are men, or these are men in the different CPG prognostic groups, from the best prognostic group right up to the worst, CPG5. And if you look at the outcomes of men, 
Uh, the blue represents death from other causes. The red, the red is death from prostate cancer. And you can see immediately that actually when you counsel somebody about the risk of prostate cancer, it's not really just about the cancer, but the other factors as well. And you really have to be getting to aggressive disease where your risk of prostate cancer starts to affect your actual mortality uh, equal to or above that of your other cause mortality. And this is a theme I'll come back to in a little while. So where we are in 2021 is that we can put AMAN into five different groups, and this is an improvement, though still a categorization system. The big problem is that if you look to see what's happening across the country in men in these groups, you find that there's a huge variation in what actually is done to them in terms of recommending treatment. This is a publication we did in collaboration with the National Prostate Cancer Audit about three years ago now. Each of these graphs represents the, one of the CPG groups, and each blue dot is a unit or a hospital in, in, in England and Wales. And if you just simply look at CPG1, you can see that the variation in the chance of being given radical treatment, meaning your securative treatment in terms of surgery or radiotherapy, is between 4 to 70% variation. And within CPG2, the next level up is 20 to 98%. And even if you go to the higher risk groups, you see this massive variation in the chance that a man may get treated or not, depending on where they are seen and who they are seen by. So clearly, you can improve all these things and improve your categorization, but that does not mean you reduce the variation in what a man may be treated or not uh, as, as it stands. So to try to look into this a bit more, um, we, we, we decided to follow this ethos by Harvey Cushing who's, a, who's a, um, a neurosurgeon actually, who lived in, who was in America over a hundred years ago. And he said that a physician is obligated to consider more than an organ, more even than a man, but the man in his world. He might well have been talking about prostate cancer, but as I told you already at that time, it was a fairly unknown disease. So Cambridge work, research and work has actually now developed the PREDICT prostate tool. Predict Prostate is a individualized prognostic tool that balances the value of treatment uh, versus, the versus the chance that actually something that nothing may happen of significance. And I'll take you through that in a minute. But it's one of the most validated tools uh, in the world, over 350,000 men, and been tested across four countries and multiple ethnicities. It not only considers the risk from prostate cancer, but also the risk from other competing morbidities and mortalities as well. It has a very simple interface. You can put in the patient's age, the PSA, the stage, all the things I've taken you through, but it also includes details about their health status, having been in hospital, illnesses, things like that. And uh, also the information from the biopsies. And what it does is it produces a um, output, a visual output of the benefit from treatment over a 10 and 15 year horizon, which you can then look to see what the actual benefit of that treatment may be. So let me briefly take you through to the scenarios which shows you how this works. So if we take this chap here, he's on the golf course, as you can see, he's 61, fit and well. He's got a PSA of 6, which is actually not particularly high. Everything's confined to the prostate, it's stage T2, and the biopsies have shown an, a middle type of prostate cancer, a group 3, in about half the samples taken. No family history or other factors that influence his outcome. And on the CPG system, he comes in as a Cambridge prognostic group 3. NICE says for men in this group, they can have either surgery or radiotherapy, or if they don't wish to, they can consider surveillance or monitoring. So if we put his details into predict prostate and predict what might happen over 15 years between having initial radical treatment, surgery or radiotherapy, or actually surveillance initially, the additional benefit he will gain from upfront treatment is actually 7%. And his risk of dying of something else uh, is about 17%. So in this chap, a 7% gain over an overall 17% competing risk is a reasonable place to suggest that perhaps he will benefit from treatment because it is a reasonably a good proportional uh, um, gain. And this figure at the bottom here is what patients can see uh, in terms of 100 men, what might happen with and without treatment. And you can toggle between uh, treatment and non-treatment and 10 and 15 year horizons. So this is a chap we might say, actually, he probably will benefit from treatment. Now let's look at this guy. He's, he's older, he's 75, this chap. He's had a heart attack and a stroke, but he's got exactly the same prostate cancer characteristics. His PSA is six, confined to the prostate, and the biopsies, again, are the same in the same proportion. And again, he falls into the same CPG3 group. 
and he still he also has the same options. But if we put this chap into predict, this is, becomes a very different story. His gain from up from treatment is actually only two percent, and his risk of dying of something else is actually um, uh, over eighty five percent because he's that much older with comorbidities. So like for like cancer, different chap, different scenario. This is not a guy we probably recommend to have active treatment because his gain will be so minimal. This is a tool which I use routinely in my clinics for suitable men, and it is hugely helpful to, um, for men to understand their context when they see this. Predict prostate also has side effect profiles which you can toggle to see what might happen from a treatment uh, over a horizon of um, up to 12 years, actually, in terms of incontinence, erectile function and bowel issues. Does this make a difference? Well, this is some work we did to find out how it influences clinicians. Ten typical case histories were sent out to clinicians and we asked them to estimate what they thought the risk of dying of prostate cancer is for each of those cases. And that green bar is actually their range of, of what they thought might happen, about 200 clinicians. The blue dot is actually what predicts it. And when they saw the predict estimates in six of 10 of these cases, they revised their, their predictions down um, to, to be more realistic. We've also done work in a randomized trial to show that it helps patients to reduce uncertainty, make their perceptions to be more real. And patients love this because it actually allows them to understand their own risk and make informed decisions. PREDICT is endorsed by NICE and has been accessed more than 90,000 times in the last three years uh, and is available in seven languages. So the way we like to think about it is that we are actually able to put a man into his own basket now rather than into one of those three or five baskets. Implementing these tools in Cambridge has allowed us to uh, have effectively reduced our overtreatment rate. In CPG1, for example, the, the, the lowest risk, if you like, we've reduced radical treatment rates by 18 percent uh, and about 50 percent of the men in CPG2. So this is really making a big impact in savings in overtreatment and the cost of treatments and, of course, managing side effects. Um, we are performing better than the national average, uh, and this is data which we've presented as well. So really, prostate cancer, when I started, it used to be called the tigers and the pussycats. But actually, it's more like many, many breeds of dogs. They all have different characteristics and personalities, and you really have to understand it well to be able to manage patients. Of course, there can be somewhat that, that tumors that seem very indolent but will behave aggressively, and some really nasty looking things which don't do very much. So prostate cancer, I would say, as I said throughout this whole talk, is all about benefits and risks. And understanding that is going to be key to managing the disease from now and also in the future. We've been able to engage the East of England in actually helping us to disseminate some of this. And they've just released this website earlier this year, which actually takes you to the tools we've developed here to disseminate practice across the, the Alliance. And we are very, we are very grateful to them to do this. And hopefully this will be taken up nationally as well. But here I want to, my, my, my second to last slide shows you another problem. A piece of work done by Diane Wheatley, who's one of our, our, our radiographers, looked to understand what information patients were being given after a diagnosis. And in short, depending on where you're seen, you might get given different elements of your diagnostic information, and you might or might not be offered uh, a chance to see some of these prognostic tools we're talking about. So really, we have an information provision inequality happening across the region, and I suspect nationally as well. And this is something we need to look into if we're really going to change things. So in summary, um, I hope I've been able to uh, tell you why I think prostate cancer is a modern pandemic in the making. It is a disease of the aging man, man who's living longer and dying of other, and not dying of other things, sorry. And the disease burden is complex, not because of its lethality, but because of its diverse disease pathways. And where balancing risk and benefit is actually quite crucial. The majority of new diagnoses will not lead to shortened survival or death. So men should not be afraid to come forward to get tested because it does not mean automatically they need to get treated. We've got many better detection tests, but no clear pathway to implementation. And we need to understand how we're going to improve that pathway to reduce over investigation as well as the over treatment, which we've addressed already. Will screening be the answer? In my view, I'm not sure we need it because what we really need is awareness raising on its asymptomatic nature, and we already have access to PSA tests. I think the real challenge and the Cambridge challenge and the regional challenge and the NHS challenge is to standardize practice and access, which in my view is actually in disarray across the NHS. 
Once you are detected with prostate cancer, we have a number of tools we've been fortunate enough to develop, which actually will help men to understand their risks. And I hope that it will be adopted uh, more than it is now. So variations in care and information provision are what is leading to late presentations, inequality and different outcomes. And that's really what we need to address. And I'll leave you uh, with this, which is actually what I think about prostate cancer a lot. It is a cancer, but not as we know it. I'd like to thank you for that, your attention and happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Vincent. That was a fascinating uh, insight into prostate cancer. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Um, we can now take questions um, from all of you. Um, if you have a question, please put it in chat. Um, Namu, I just need to ask you a question. I, when I look at chat, I can't see any entries, entries in the chat thing. If you can see it, perhaps you could read out. Um, yeah, no, there's no question questions. OK, right. Yeah. So um, let, let me ask you a question, um, Vincent, then while people are thinking. And, 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 and I'll also, um, after that, just give everyone a quick uh, summary of progression on our new cancer hospital, which is uh, so information of which has been in the news recently. So, uh, Mike, I've got a couple of questions, really. Uh, you mentioned that um, prostate cancer, like many other cancers, was on the rise and and sort of explain the reasons why prostate cancer was rising uh, over the you know next few years is that are those reasons the same for uh, breast cancer and colorectal cancer and other ones as well uh, my second question while yeah. you're thinking about that is yeah. you mentioned that your trials covered a number of different ethnic ethnicities uh, in it and i wondered whether there was any variation in incidence or outcomes uh, in relation to people's ethnicity in prostate cancer? Um, thanks, Neil. Um, so what was your first question again? First one well, related to uh, the reasons why so many cancers oh, okay. are yeah. on the rise. Yeah. Yeah. You explained yeah. that for prostate, but you also showed a graph of all the other ones yeah. rising too. Yeah. So, so Neil, this is a really interesting point. And actually, if you think about it from a philosophical standpoint, the human body was not designed to live for so long. And it is, it is not a coincidence that most cancers arise in the older person, isn't it? Um, there are no doubt some genetic factors and other things which come into it, environmental factors. But um, but I think, you know, it's true. You know, we've managed to stop death from high, from high blood pressure, from, from strokes, from cardiovascular. We've got all these drugs, people on statins. All of that's not doing it. But the body is continuing to age and mutate. And, and in a very simplistic way, I think that's why they're picking things up. It also makes managing cancer quite complex because actually you can actually throw the throw the book at a cancer and cause lots of morbidity, but not actually gain overall survival. In terms of your second point, I think what you're asking is the tools we've developed, how reliable are they in other ethnicities? And actually what's really fascinating is that um, if you take the race out and you actually do a like for like comparison of cancers, particularly prostate cancer, outcomes are actually the same. But there's no doubt that certain races have a higher incidence of developing cancer. But once you develop it, like for like cancers behave the same way. Mm. OK, thanks. Um, there are a number of questions coming in um, right now, but I thought I'd just uh, just spend a couple of minutes just giving you just a quick update on um, our new uh, Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital, uh, which is being designed and, and thought about right now. So um, th this uh, is a unique proposition um, in the UK. And I, the idea behind the new cancer hospital is to integrate um, both the clinic and science together into one uh, building so that research and treatment are working hand in hand for the benefit of patients. And this should help us um, provide much more personalised uh, solutions to cancer and improve outcomes tremendously. Um, it's an interesting fact that one in two people are likely to um, be affected by cancer at some point in their lifetime. And therefore, probably everyone in this audience has either been affected or um, knows someone who is affected by cancer. And so this is why uh, a new um, hospital like this is so important. Um, 
In terms of where we're at with it, the uh, business cases are going through the system at the moment. The latest one called the outline business case, we're expecting um, approval imminently from the government and work is on the final full business case. Uh, when that's completed, we should be able to start uh, the building work itself in 2024 and hope to complete the uh, building by 2027. Um, the funding for this is coming from the government. It is part of the new hospital programme, which you may have uh, seen on the news today. It's one of those 40 hospitals. So it is uh, does have some funding, though not all from the government. Uh, some of the funding will become will be coming from fundraising activities from the university and from Addenbrooke's Charitable Trust. And if you'd like to find out more about the Addenbrooke's Charitable Trust work on, on fundraising, particularly fundraising from the public, they have some hubs in the oncology um, waiting area in outpatients where you can go and uh, have a look and find out more. So that's just a quick summary um, of, of the hospital as it is at the moment. So I'm now going to... Uh, check out some of the questions that have come through. So uh, starting at the beginning, Vincent, there's a question here saying, is there an age at which men should seek screening? Um, asking for a friend? Not quite sure. Now, is there an age yeah, at which ask, people should seek screening? Yeah, asking for a friend, eh? Um, uh, the question so is would... being asked on behalf of a friend, yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I meant. <laughs> um, so, so there is no screening as such, but if you're over 50, um, then I think you should go and get a PSA done and see what it shows. Uh, I think the key thing that all men need to know is that a PSA test does not automatically mean that you're going to have to go through the gauntlet of treatment. And I think that's a, that's a myth we need to debunk as well. So get a test done. If it's elevated, come along and see your friendly urology department and we'll see what's what. Okay. And are any change in PSA value of any predictive use? I'm presuming this is a question about before a diagnosis, effectively somebody who's not known to have anything. So uh, there's been a lot of debate and question about this. The problem is that actually there is no clear evidence one way or the other. So what I would suggest is that depending on your age, have a chat with your GP, get a PSA done. If it's above the threshold, uh, which I've already said can be a little bit variable, but by and large still works, then get referred up. So it's not. So, I wouldn't really be so worried about a changes in PSA value. PSA will go up and down all the time. Every minute, every hour, uh, it goes up and down. So it's, okay. it's it's very difficult to track that. So Rob Morrison asks, I have a PSA of five to six uh, and have an enlarged prostate, which I have been told is not cancerous. Should I ask for an MRI scan? I think if you've got a PSA 5 to 6, then go and speak to your GP. If you meet the criteria for referral, get sent in, and then let's take it from there. Okay, so see your GP. Um, yeah. You suggest yes, three just to say that if, if the PSA is 5 to 6 and above the level for referral, you should be referred. Okay. Uh, you suggest that frequent peeing is not a symptom. Are there any symptoms that you should be aware of that might prompt you to get a PSA test? Sorry, was that no? No. Oh, yeah, right. That's it. No. No. <laughs> OK. More to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the typical symptoms of prostate cancer? None. So what might prompt you to see a GP? There isn't it. There isn't any, unless you've got very advanced metastatic prostate cancer and I've got, you know, uh, bone pain, consistent persistent bone pain. But there are no signs which you can say are due to prostate cancer. So to sort of summarise what you said earlier, in fact, actually, uh, for, for men who are, you know, thinking and worrying about this, as I'm sure there are many in this uh, audience, um, if you're over 50, then you can ask for a PSA test at your GP. And well, be go, the, go and have a chat. Go, go and have a chat, chat find out the risks and saying. benefits. Yeah. ECUK okay, risk right. checker is, a, is an online one if you don't, can't get to your GP. Yeah, that's it. The next question, Dave Blake, actually just follows on, so I think you probably answered it. You mentioned that there are often no symptoms. What are the primary symptoms that lead to tests being introduced for a patient? So I think you're saying there are many. Um, yeah. Uh, Sharon Peacock, uh, one of our non-exec directors, says many thanks for this great talk, Vincent. You said that prostate cancer is often asymptomatic, but there is no screening programme. So on a very practical level, when should men consider asking their GP for a test? Well, I think the answer to that was age 50 or above. Is that if right? Or above. I mean, yeah, I mean, 
there's no hard and fast rules about it, but I think that's a very good guide. If you're over 50, you should get a PSA done, uh, or you should at least consider it and speak to your GP about it. Or like I said, you can look at the PC UK risk checker. Uh, Anna says, asks if prostate cancer is metastasized, what is the trends of PSA that should be of concern during the pandemic? A drug yeah. called enzalutamide was prescribed to healthy yeah. men with advanced prostate cancer. Has this changed outcomes in advanced prostate cancer? I mean, that's quite a complex question. I, I would say it's a difficult one to do over a webinar um, to whoever the question that you should speak to your oncologist about that. Um, that, that that's quite a <laughs> intricate and detailed question. Okay. Uh, enzalutamide uh, is one of a, a plethora of drugs which have come out which have shown benefit uh, in primary metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, in terms of survival, but I think that uh, otherwise uh, that's quite a complex question for this. I think. Uh, Jonathan says, what causes prostate cancer? Is there anything as regards lifestyle that can help the cancer to remain stable or even to disappear? I suspect he's uh, thinking about things like exercise, diet and things like that, that you could do as a, as a man to yeah. avoid it progressing or even appearing. The only two uh, there are only things which cause prostate cancer if you're a man with a prostate and you've got testosterone. So if you haven't got one of those two, then you won't get prostate cancer. That's about it, really. There's nothing that I'm aware of that can help cancer stabilize or disappear. I've never seen it disappear, uh, which would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, except yeah. if you remove the prostate. So effectively, uh, the simple answer is if you have a prostate and you've got testosterone, i.e. you're not a eunuch, then you're at risk of prostate cancer. But when and how that might happen is very difficult to say. Certainly, certain ethnicities have a higher incidence. And if you carry the BRCA mutation in your family line, you have a higher incidence as well. Uh, so those are the, some of the factors to consider. So would you advise having a genetic test then? No. Um, no? no. OK. No. Um, so the next one was, uh, thank you for your talk, this is John Davidson, um, says, what might be the cause of the regional variation you showed at the start of your talk? And uh, should I retire to the north of England? Presuming to get a better outcome. <laughs> That's a nice part <laughs> of the world. Um, so there may be good I mean, reasons for driving to the north of England, but I doubt this is one. <laughs> yeah. um, the reason why that's different is multifactorial. One of them is actually in this region, men are more likely to come forward for testing and therefore you get diagnosed. There isn't a uh, something in the water, it's not about a soft water, hard water business or, or environment or anything like that. So it's actually more about getting men to test. And actually this region has one of the highest awareness rates, shall we say. And I think that's the reason you see the variation in the pickup. Oh, okay. So uh, in Morris asks, apart from PSA testing, post -radi radiotherapy and hormone treatment, are there other markers, e.g. MRI or PET scans to monitor success or otherwise of the treatment? So the PSA actually is a very good marker to monitor a post-treatment response and relapse, and that is the one I would recommend. That then leads to other tests if necessary. OK. Um, Tom Shackleton asks if um, an informed patient has a PSA test of more than 50 YO and is normal, would you recommend any repeat PSA and at what interval? Currently PSA required for investigation of LUTS. Sorry, I don't know what that is. Little evidence for this. Thanks. This is from a slim fingered GP. Everybody, you need to find out who this is and go and see this guy. Uh, if you want to get tested, he's got slim fingers. So that's a really interesting point. There is no hard evidence on what the PSA testing interval should be. But I would say that by and large, if you have a normal PSA at age 50, your lifetime risk of developing lethal prostate cancer is actually quite low. And there is some evidence that says that if you were to say test all men at 40 and it's below one or something like that, then your risk of prostate cancer is so low, you don't need to test again. So there, it's very hard to give a guide about this. And I would say that really, you know, um, you can pluck a number. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say any less than three to four years, perhaps five years, or come back again when you're 60, something like that. It depends, I guess, to some regard, whether your PSA is near the margin of the threshold or actually very far away from the threshold, shall we say. Uh, LUTS is low urinary tract symptoms. Uh, and, and you're right, and this is actually a, a real dissonance here because nice guidance in, in terms of GPs 
puts PSA and prostate cancer together with LUT, so it gets very complicated. One thing that PSA helps in terms of LUTs is that large, it is a bit of a surrogate of prostate size, so in that regard, it can help. But very often, like I said earlier on, it has an inverse relationship between prostate size and symptoms and actually finding lethal prostate cancers. Uh, OK, thanks. So the next one is uh, just a quick question. What is the referral measure? I'm not quite sure what that means. Yeah. What does that mean, referral measure? I, that's the only question. I can't help with that. So let's skip over that. Yeah. And uh, Julia Loudon, who's another Governor, former league governor, has asked, given your answer to question one, uh, if you can remember that, should men over 50 sent, be sent letters saying it would be sensible to take a PSA test? Overtreatment based on screening is a risk for breast cancer, yet screening is a clear starting point for women to be aware of breast changes, etc. So if you start uh, sending letters to men, then that is screening, effectively. You're basically looking for cases. And there is a very fine distinction between that and a man coming forward and having an informed decision about the PSA test. So, uh, you know, screening is a funny thing, or PSA testing as a screening test is a funny thing. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not great for the economy, for the country, epidemiologically, because you find a lot of cancers that you never need to treat. But for the individual, it's obviously can be life-changing if you find it. So there's not a straight answer to that. But once you start sending letters inviting people to have something done, that is effectively de facto screening. Now, overtreatment is a really interesting point. Um, most of my talk, as you will see, is talking about risk benefit. And we have been able to eliminate overtreatment uh, or at least provide men with evidence to avoid overtreatment, uh, so much so that our current UK rate of treating very uh, CPG1, the best prognostic group, is about 4 to 5%. In America, that rate is 60 to 70 percent. So, so we are pretty good in this country at not overtreating. Uh, we've, in a way, compared to breast, done it the other way around. We've worked out all the things that we shouldn't do, and now we're asking the screening question. And I think breast is going the other way, if you like. Mm. So, so there's a follow-up. The next question is a sort of very close follow-up to that, which is basically saying it doesn't seem right that there's a lack of proactiveness towards prostate cancer compared to other cancers. Uh, for example, why is bowel cancer for men considered more important than prostate cancer, for which there is a regular five-yearly screening program for men over um, 55, I think? I think that's because of lethality, and this is the crux of it. If you're diagnosed with bowel cancer, and I'm not an expert in this, your chance of dying of the disease is actually much higher uh, in later stages than actually prostate cancer. And I think I've oh, shown right. you already, with prostate, you can be diagnosed and actually never die of it. So that balance is what the All government right. and the NHS epidemiologists actually have to balance, have to, to see. If you have limited resources, are you going to put it into this very large demographic cancer with low lethality or into a, another cancer with high lethality? And I think this is something which, you know, an organization at like NHS has to consider. OK, Vincent, I, I'm looking at the uh, the clock now and I think we're going to have to uh, finish shortly. Actually, only a couple more questions. Maybe we'll have time for those. Um, so let me try this one then. Uh, there's a significant rise in testosterone supplementation in men through the, through private online services. Annual PSA monitoring usually done. Is there any significant increase in risk for those no. who have testosterone supplement? No, as long as testosterone is within the normal physiological levels, then you should assume that actually it will be like a man who doesn't need supplements. So your risk should be the same. OK, uh, are there any preventative measures? I think you have answered that question already. Um, how does predict your predict um, system compare in prediction accuracy compared to other prediction models, e.g. the Rotterdam prostate cancer tool? Uh, so predict is a post diagnosis prognostic tool. The Rotterdam tool is to detect cancer or your chance of having cancer. So they're very different tools completely. OK, so tackling different things. OK, so I, I think we're going to have to finish now. I know you have to get off to another meeting. So I'd just like to say, Vincent, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating talk and very enlightening. And I've certainly learned a lot uh, about our disease. Of course, none of us who are men uh, ever hope we'll, we'll um, end up with, but probably will. Um, so those of you who have asked questions or still want to ask questions, um, we will capture those that we haven't answered and, and get back to you on that. Uh, we're also going to post a, a little quick feedback survey, which Namu is going to put in the chat. And we'd very much like to encourage you to click that link and just uh, answer the 
uh, four or five questions to just give us some feedback on how this uh, talk has been for you in terms of its level and so forth. So please do take a couple of moments to fill that in. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, Vincent, for a brilliant talk and thank everyone for coming along today and listening in. So that's goodbye for me. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.